Hunter is a creature of the night, whose very name strikes terror in the hearts of man. He fears only mirrors, the scent of garlic, and the sight of a crucifix. He feeds upon human blood. Only sunlight or a stake driven through his heart can destroy him or those whose blood he drinks. His name is... Don To the Batmobile. Let's go. Atomic batteries to power. Turbines to speed. You're ready to move up. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware or not. There was a time when you could make cartoons to sell um, your merchandise, your toys. Uh, I don't know if well, you're aware that of that time period. That ended like when G.I. Joe and Transformers yeah, came out. Yeah, I remember like when I was still writing those things um, that I think when they started, there may have been like Transformers commercials on the Transformers show. And then there was an FCC or something uh, right. complaint or regulation or something that came in and you could i think i think then you could like sell you could advertise gi joe on the transformer show and vice versa but you couldn't like sell gi joe on a gi joe show yeah i guess cause because it was like they were thinking of it as pretty much brainwashing the kids pretty much which it was they actually had animated <laughs> commercials for both the gi joe and transformer comic books i remember in the right and that's and that's right before they um you know, took away the ban or, or what, whatever you want to call it, to, and so you can make cartoons mm. for the toys and, and such. So that would have been, what, in the 80s, early 80s? Yeah, I'd say yeah. early 84. 80s, right when G.I. Joe came out, which was, what, what I don't know, 84, 85? Yeah. A little trivia. Hmm. Um, okay, oh, well, let me ask you a question. Sure. Is this going out to people live, or is this going to be recorded? And no, then... it's recorded, and I, I edit it, and we oh, usually okay. uh, post them on uh, Saturdays. Okay. So, do you get any comments from people? Or they... uh, we we really haven't gotten any fan mail or anything. How rude! No, we've <laughs> we've we've had downloads. We can we can tell what people are downloading. Um, mm-hmm. But as far as feedback, not much. So. Will actually went to the New York Comic Con. They actually had a panel on fan, fan films. Yeah, I was able to speak on behalf of uh, this podcast and as well as my my own website, which is fanboytheater. dot com. And, uh, you know, it was an honor to get to speak about, uh, you know, the fan-made film. And your name was mentioned right from the, right from the start uh, during a presentation. I don't know if you've met Mr. Clive Young. Have you met him? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. Well, he, uh, he put together a book. Um, it's called Homemade Hollywood. And it's basically the history of the fan-made or amateur-made film, you know, involving, you know, existing characters. And you're, of course, one of the you know names at the very beginning of the book. So you came up, and uh, it was great to you know. So I think I saw a couple of clips of of your movies and uh, a few others. And I don't know if you've ever seen, but in the early '80s, there was actually an Indiana Jones a Raiders of the Lost Ark fan film. Have you ever seen that? It was like '80 when it first came out. Mm, I know that, that this is Ring a Bell. Yeah, it was a shot by shot um, reinterpretation, or not reinterpretation, but it was a shot by shot. Um, like a remake. Yeah, basically by a bunch or of kids. Counterfeit or uh... <laughs> well, it's actually it, it, it's endorsed by uh, Spielberg, and um, he actually allows it to be shown. I guess you got a kick out of a bunch of kids doing his film. I think that was probably, probably yeah. Laugh. Plus, they encourage Lucas. I mean, he's into he encourages the fan films now, and I just think they they encourage new filmmakers. So I think that's well, why. Lucas is basically the big. You know, he's still basically a film student. <laughs> he gives tons of money to the USC. And um, you know he promotes student films. I think I think he would probably be happiest making student films again. Yeah, I think you're right because he really, after the last uh, prequel film, he really wanted to make some personal films, I guess, mm-hmm. and which I haven't seen. But um, but I, I do agree with that. And actually, that's a good segue into the uh, Empire Strikes Back. How did you get involved with the uh, novelization of, of that film? Well, it's not a really um, too sexy of a story. It's just um, I had a friend who was working at the Lucas editorial offices named Craig Miller, and um, he knew that they were looking 
for somebody, actively looking for somebody to write the novelization of Empire Strikes Back, and there were three science fiction uh, writers that he was promoting, hoping that one of them would get the job. And um, at the same time, I had been sort of involved in some of the Star Wars projects. Uh, I uh, had written some of the Marvel comics. Um, I was working with Russ Manning. On a, a weird, it looked like I was going to be writing some of the, the Sunday newspaper strips for Russ, who was the artist. And then Jerry Conway and I were going to team up. We got an assignment, which it turned out never happened because of the Empire coming up, to write a character novel uh, about Wookiees. So my name had been already familiar in the, in the office. Um, I went to school with Lucas, but that's not how I got the job. Lucas had actually offered me the first Star Wars novel, which I turned down because it was going to be ghostwritten. They were only going to pay $1,000, and there was no royalties involved. And then for the next two or three years, I kicked myself. You know, right. All of the ghosts he did when he turned down Frankenstein in 1931. And, but, you know, so he never, he said, you know, he said, I never thought even of asking you. I to turn it down once, I figured to turn it down again. But, of course, a lot had changed, and nobody knew what Star Wars was going to be. You know, when the first one came out, and by, by the time it came around to me, it really was an empire. <laughs> and um, so anyway, Craig Miller had submitted uh, material that had written by me and his other two friends, and um, they liked what they read of mine. They said they had a sense, sort of a sense of humor to it that they, the others didn't have, and they took me out to lunch and made me an offer, and this time I didn't turn it down. It was simple as that. Made an offer you couldn't refuse. No, I couldn't. And, you know, it, it turned out, I mean, the money wasn't great. Still, the money wasn't great. And it wasn't ghostwritten for a change. But it's opened so many doors. I mean, to this day, it's never been out of print. And, you know, I can tell somebody, if I'm, if I'm trying to make an impression, let's say, with a resume, I can tell, oh, I wrote The Invaders, and I wrote, you know, Dagar the Invincible, and I wrote, I wrote this book on movies. Well, nobody knows, nobody's ever, in the real world, outside of fans, nobody knows what those things are. You know, uh, and so, but if I say the Empire Strikes Back, immediately it, a bell goes off, and they can relate to that, and it kind of legitimizes me as a writer. I was just going to say, uh, speaking of Dagar and your other comic book characters you created for for Dell Comics, I was going to ask you, um, have you ever thought about making them into films at any point? Like, well, uh, we know Spencer? first first of all, the, the rights of those characters now are really, really. Nobody seems to know. I've had people actually try to get the rights so they could just do the comics again. And nobody seems to know even who owns them. It's become a real legal, difficult trail of, of trying to, you know, you know who, who bought it from who and all this sort of thing. Back when the comics were still being done, I um, actually for a while was trying to get, first of all, a Dagar movie. Um, that I was going to write. My friend Bob Greenberg was going to direct, and Jim Danforth was going to do the stop motion special effects. Jim actually did a painting of Dagar, which is hanging on my wall, an oil painting of uh, one of the scenes from the movie that we were going to do. And uh, I met with the people in New York uh, from Gold Key Comics, from Western Publishing Company. And at the same time, I was trying to get the rights to Dr. Specter and Turok, Son of Stone. I wanted to do a Turok movie. And then I had a, a producer out here uh, named Alan Waite, who was very much interested in doing Dr. Spector as a uh, TV series. And I was pushing for Bob Belay, who was like the cover model for some of those Vampirella issues back around that time, to play Lakota, his secretary girlfriend. And uh, But they, I could never get him. To, you know, they were always kind of hemmed and hawed, and I could never pin him down, so I, was, I was never was able to get the rights, and then the books got canceled and everything else happened after that. So uh, I, I've tried over the years. Um, I have a character in our next movie, which is called She-Wolves, um, who is uh, basically Dr. Spectre with a different name, except this time he's the, the Native American. He's the American Indian, and his girlfriend is not. But it's the same relationship between the two and everything. He's a psychic investigator. But I had looked at it as a TV series kind of on the order of the Night Stalker where every week you would be, you know, finding some other kind of, you know, monster of the week, supernatural thing of the week. Would you have a preference, of the, going back to the fan films again, would you have a preference with between your superhero and your horror base? Do you have one favorite? Or? You know, I really don't know. Um, 
and you can throw in dinosaurs too. Um, yeah, those are my three main that, yeah. my three main loves, you know, as far as making films and writing stories and things like that. Uh, I think in more recent years, like the last couple of years, I've I've gravitated more towards the horror stuff again. But there was a period, you know, back like in the late 60s, that the horror stuff and the dinosaurs all took a, a backseat to the superheroes. So I guess it just goes in phases. And they're all kind of connected anyway. You know, dinosaurs fighting superheroes, superheroes fighting vampires, vampires fighting dinosaurs, I guess, you know. <laughs> they're all kind of those. You, know, you, you, can, you can bring them all together if you want to a single big epic. And I think two perfect examples of that would be your film, uh, The Adventures of the Spirit. Spirit. At one point, you know, there's, you know, Captain America appears, Green Hornet shows up, the shadow, <laughs> the wolf man. Yeah, that, that was a America. fun thing to do. And we just made that because Bob Burns happened to have all those costumes and things. That's, I was actually going to ask you about that. I know you I actually were fortunate enough to have real props from, uh, you know, the Republic Serial, you had the Captain America suit, I know, and I know yeah. uh, uh, the actual cane used in the original Universal Studios Wolfman film, which I think yeah. is really, really cool to find out. So I, I don't blame you for use, using as much of that as you, as you could, you know, just to say I had, you know, Frankenstein's mask in my movie, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's, that's, that's really cool for back then. Oh, yeah, yeah, and at that time, no other fans had access to any of that stuff. That's right, and I mean, to this day, I mean, I, have you ever heard of the gentleman, uh, Mr. Vincent DeFate? What's his name? His name is Vincent DeFate. He's actually a painter. Oh, yeah, he's an artist, right? Yeah, yeah, he was actually one of my I think he does art and writes articles and things for film facts. That's right, that's right. Yeah, he's, a, he's my professor in, in film school. Oh, really? Not in film school, in art school. I went to art school at FIT. I was an illustrator, uh, and, I, and I took lessons from him. He taught a science fiction class. Uh -huh. And he actually mentioned you too in the in the class, so I figured I'd throw that in. <laughs> You're world famous, Tom. Yeah, he's a very much respected, uh, you know, author now. With yeah, we used to kiss his butt <laughs> big time. We were like, we would bow when he showed us a painting. It was just so so great and so inspiring. His work was just fantastic. Oh yeah, yeah. And he would talk about taking trips out to the you know that gentleman's house with the with the you know the creature from the black lagoon suit sitting right in front of him. Mm -hmm. Me being, you know, him telling that story, I was just like, wow, you know, because here I'm 33 and I still look at those movies like as incredible pieces of work. To this day, the creature from the Black Lagoon suit, I think, remains one of the best pieces of of, of Hollywood makeup I've ever seen. Like that was the greatest costume. Oh yeah, when I saw that movie as a kid, you know, when it first came out, and that was my monster, you know, Frankenstein and all that was that was my mother's, you know, my you know her generation, but the creature. And I guess Godzilla were like my monsters because they came out when just when I was right the right age. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, to this day, they remain big, big time favorites. I was actually going to ask you also about your fan films. I know at one point you had plans to make a Blue Beetle and a Commando Yank fan film. Yeah. Um, I Don't ask me why. I, I've, I've always had this strange fascination, fascination with the Blue Beetle. I think the reason was, one of the reasons was when I was a kid, uh, and I liked superheroes as a kid, but there weren't any superhero comics being published except for, you know, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman. Uh, this was the time. And then they um, started Space Adventures over at Charlton, started reprinting the Blue Beetle, and he was like the only other character out there. So I, at that time, and uh, so I've always loved the Blue Beetle, even though the character was, there was no consistency to it or anything. And that's probably part of the fascination. But with the Commando Yank, I was going through this whole period where I wanted to make superhero films, but I was kind of chicken to wear those tights. So I was trying to find superheroes that had baggy pants, and um, Commando Yank was one of them. So that was the reason uh, for Commando Yank. Who would be able to do too, because he kind of has, has that connection with, you know, Egyptology and all that other stuff with the scarabs and... Well, not the original Blue Beetle. That was the one that came out in the '60s. But um, in the original character, he was just he was a he was a cop by day, and the Blue Beetle by night. And uh, it was really kind of a takeoff. The name was a takeoff on the Green Hornet, Blue Beetle, Green Hornet. And it was a radio show, and you know it was a very popular character, even though it was a strange character. <laughs> Leaping down from the underworld to smash gangland comes a friend of the unfortunate, enemy of criminals. The mysterious, all-powerful character, a problem to the police. But a crusader for law, in reality, Dan Garrett, a rookie patrolman, loved by everyone but suspected by none of being the Blue Beetle. 
As the blue beetle, he hides behind the strange mask and a suit of impenetrable blue chain armor. Flexible as silk, but stronger than steel. Hey, I actually got that on uh, CD, actually, the Blue Beetle uh, radio show. Yeah, there's, uh, there's all of the episodes that are still around are out on an MP3 now. Yeah. Yeah, they have everything, a shadow and the old, you know, Batman radio. Doc plays. Savage. What will happen at the airfield? Will the Blue Beetle be able to uncover this plot in time? Will he be able to run the criminals to earth? Those are all questions which will be answered in the next edition of the Blue Beetle. <laughs> You know, today at comic book conventions, how everybody walks around dressed up like characters and all that stuff? Yeah. I know that back way back when in the 60s, you were actually doing that, too. You were. Well, it wasn't. I didn't walk around dressed like that. It was because yeah. they had... Um, this is the, a lot of the conventions... Uh, I imagine they're still doing this. It's been a long time since I've been to one. But they would have a costume contest. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so I just entered a costume contest. I mean, I didn't walk around all day in that suit. I just waited till. the... Costume. The contest started, and then I would show up in the costume and do my thing on the stage, and afterwards, you know, get back to my normal identity. But uh, yeah, I did, did quite a few, uh, quite a bit of that, right up until the early 1970s. Yeah, things have changed. Trip you in a uh, 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 Solomon, uh, a uh, Solomon Grundy. That was, yeah, I went to Solomon Grundy, <laughs> and then um, the last time I was in a contest, and I won first prize in the humorous division. I was at the World Science Fiction Convention, I think, in seventy. One or seventy-two as Frankenberry. <laughs> I saw that. I actually saw that costume. I thought that was great. <laughs> yeah, and I sent a photo of me in that uh, outfit to General Mills, <laughs> thinking, "Hey, look, I'm doing some free promotion for you." And they almost threatened to sue me. Really? Yeah, I had a great photo of a little kid. I was holding the cereal box in my hand, and a little kid was taking some cereal out of the box, and he was looking at me like he was looking at Santa Claus or something. And it was such a wonderfully touching photo, you know, a human interest kind of thing. And um, they let me know that I was violating their trademarks and copyrights yeah. and all kinds of things. So once again, things haven't changed so much. <laughs> That's the big thing uh, Will and I get off on all the time is uh, more like Marvel going after the fan filmmakers, basically doing the same thing. Mm. Well, I was real worried I was going to get in trouble for putting that Teenage Movie Maker DVD out because I was using those characters. Yeah, but you did the smart thing. You you put it out as the making of, and then the films yeah, were Yeah, that's why I did extras. the documentary, because exactly. the movies are like the supplementary features. Exactly. Uh, they're the bonus features. And it's everything is historical context, and, you know, plus the fact that nobody ever, you know, those movies were made so long ago. Why didn't anybody jump on me 30 years ago when there was a photo saying famous monsters of me as exactly, you know, somebody or other? Uh, so uh, nobody, so far nothing's happened. So I, I, and by the time, if I do get a cease and desist by that time, everybody who wants that will probably have bought it anyway. Right, so it right, matter. right. That's what I'm saying about these new uh, fan filmmakers. Don't advertise what you're doing. Don't make a big stink of it. Go make your film. Get it on the Internet. Let people start downloading it. Once the big boys of the money start, you know, telling you cease and desist, mm -hmm. then it's been downloaded by a gazillion people and spread yeah. around, and then who cares at that point? It's it's out there. Yeah, well, do you two guys make films, too? No, I do not. I just appreciate the fan films. Oh. I dabble. I actually dabble in screenwriting. I actually wrote, I don't know if you're familiar with the character, uh, John Constantine Hellblazer. Oh, yeah. The Alan Moore character. I actually wrote a, uh, a full script for a uh, this John Constantine fan film, uh, with a gentleman named uh, Christopher Notarelli. I don't know if you're familiar with uh -huh. uh, BlinkyProductions.com. He actually did. Oh, great. Uh, the modern day Blue Beetle, not the you know, not the one of old, but the you know, the Dan Garrett. Mm -hmm. Which he does dress up in the cons and wear it all day. <laughs> well, you know, some of those conventions you think we shot it, but it didn't like. Four seven, walking yeah. around in out weird outfits. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, and I'm actually writing a GI Joe script right now, also. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to take my shot at uh, doing the, uh, the the screenplay writing and all that stuff. Would you do mm. advice for me? No good for you. Screenplay writer? Do I? Yeah. Well, one thing is you almost have to live in California if you're, if you're serious about, really? you know, selling it to a studio or a production company. Well, it's plus who you know. No, also. it's not that. It's who knows. Really? Who. 
was, who knows you, is what... Well, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was an age thing, too. Uh, after you're about 35 years old, and you, if you don't have a... Even, even if you do have a, uh, a firm foot in the business, you'll be probably, unless you're Spielberg or somebody, be phased out. No, thanks. Because you want young, attractive people walking through the corridors of their studios. And thanks, Don. You just killed my chances. <laughs> Before, you know, so I'm. Uh, that's why I'm an independent. I, yeah. When I realized that I was never going to sell anything to a studio because of my age, if nothing else, that's when I became a producer. And I now I can be now. You know, my friends, some of my friends who are like A-list directors, who are younger than me and they can't get work because of their age. Wow. And I'm making movies, and they're yeah. coming to my screenings. You know. Well, don't you, don't you think and nobody's telling me what to do? And I don't have somebody 20 years old who's never seen a black and white movie or heard of a sprocket hole. You know, telling me how to make my movie or right. telling me to put his girlfriend in the lead or anything. I, you know, I got complete creative control limited only by the amount of money we can raise on each project. That's great. Or the lack thereof. <laughs> hey, you're doing what you're doing. You're yeah. doing what you want to do. Yeah. You did, don't you think as the technology increases and, um, I mean, it, it's way cheaper, I think, or correct me if I'm wrong, to make a film these days, um, put in some quality special effects, and oh sure, you know, I mean, most you know people. I mean, we shot this last one on high def. It looks pretty much just like 35 millimeter film when you watch it, and but it brought the cost down and the time involved, you know, immensely. Don't you think and, that? I'm sorry. Oh no, I was going to say, yeah, you're right. It's it's getting to be more and more movies made in the computer. But it's not like anything else, recording. I mean, in the old days, when we played in the band, you recorded a record. The whole band went in there, and they mic'd every instrument, and you played together. And No, you don't have to go to the studio. You can stay home, record your part. If it's a little bit too fast or out of key, they can tweak it in the studio and put it all together. And it's like publishing or anything else. Right. Uh, almost everything you can do at home now. Do you think that's changing the face of Hollywood? Are they oh, are they yeah, scared? It's facing on a, uh, a lot of distributors and people that yeah. can, you know, like we're gonna on our new movie Blood Scarab, we're gonna for the first time do our own DVD distribution on this because up until a couple of years ago you couldn't you could you couldn't even get it in the store without um, uh, a, a distributor who's gonna probably rip you off anyway. <laughs> you know now you can do it yourself and you can get on Amazon just with a barcode. Right. You can get your shopping list and put a barcode on it, and Amazon will probably sell it. Do you think um, the powers that be, I mean, I know there's a, there's a long road ahead, but do you think the people with all the money are kind of getting scared with the new technology? I would think so. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, look at look at how many talented people now um, are out of work because CGI came in. You know, people that were doing stop motion animation, animatronics and things like that. Um, who can't get the jobs now. You know, it's like uh, the guys who made the, the horse whips or whatever, you know, when the automobile came in. You know, if you don't move along with it, um, you know, you're going to get left behind. Right. And uh, and now you can do You can make a whole movie on the computer without it getting leaving your desk. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just the way everything is. It's, a, it's just the way... Just look at the, the retail business and how that's changed. When the malls came in, the malls put so many big department stores out of business, and the malls haven't been around that long, and suddenly a lot of those are going out of business because people now, like me, do most of their shopping, you know, at home. Yeah, they, right. they, 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 they bring up a website, or go to Amazon, and, they, you know, I can, if I get the urge to buy a DVD or a book and it's 3 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> I'll just walk over to the computer, you know, 10 seconds later, it's in the mail to me. Right. And it's cheaper. And I haven't spent any gas driving someplace or paid for parking. So, yeah, everything's changing so fast. Or now you don't even have to order. You can just download it. Yeah, yeah. Which I guess is, you know, it has its downsides and its upsides. Yeah. Well, I, my point was more towards, like, the people with money. I mean, the people in Hollywood with money. Um, I mean, all this new technology, now you and, say, me and Will can go out and make a good movie. Um, we don't necessarily need the backing of a Hollywood studio, um, and we can get it out there to people. Yeah, is, you can. Isn't Hollywood kind of? Do, do you feel that Hollywood's kind of scared as far as 
you can get information out there now more? Well, you know, if you if you're thinking of Hollywood theatrical movies, most of those movies, you know, something like you or I could never afford to do because you know, with, where every shot is a half a second long, you know, and it's just assault of the senses. Right. We could never do something. We could never make a movie like Transformers or uh, something like that. Um, and that's what's selling in the theaters now. They give you, it's, it's always, it's always been like that. You know, in the 50s, they were worried when television came in, and so they came up with 3D, and that for a while got the people back in the theaters, and, you know, widescreen formats and all kinds of things. And uh, as long as you give people going to the theaters and spending 10 or $12 just to walk in the door, something they can't get on the home screen, right? you know, it, it, you'll, still, you'll, you'll, you'll still have a business going. You might not attract the same people. I mean, most older people now don't go. I mean, when I was a kid, we went to the movies once a week, no matter what was playing, pretty much. We just went, that was what you did, you went to the movies. And uh, the whole family went. And now it's mostly, you know, kids. People talking on cell phones. And, and the, <laughs> the, the, Texting while they're watching the movie. Yeah. <laughs> they actually have a warning. I, I only go to theaters no if I have to the- or if I get invited to a free screening. Right. What's that, Will? Sorry. I actually went to the theater the other day, and it's and they actually had a message at the beginning of the film: "Please, no texting during the film." And I was just like, "Oh my god!" Isn't that the big thing now? Because they're doing um, the Brandon Fraser movie, uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth, in 3D, and supposedly this big aviator movie that James Cameron's doing is yeah, going to be this. Disney stuff seems to be having 3D versions. Of that yeah, that seems to be the next big thing that's that's coming out. Because everyone has a home, you know, theater system, so. I don't I remember being a kid and putting on the old creature feature in the you know the early 80s and the creature for the Black Lagoon was in 3D at the time. And I remember watching that and just being like, "Oh my god, it was like the coolest thing ever." It was like he was in your living room. You know, he was reaching out of the screen, he was clawing at you, you know. Mm. I, I miss those. I wish they still did that on TV, but they don't do it anymore unfortunately. Cause, you know, you used to see all these cable access guys who have these, you know, these late night chiller theater shows. But uh, there's really not a lot of them around anymore. Well, uh, you know, a lot of people just said bad televisions and it didn't work. So it disappointed yeah. many people that they just didn't continue on a large scale with it. The last thing I saw on TV with 3D and looked well, actually pretty well was a Rolling Stones concert. But that was a different a different process. Uh, actually, you know the band U2? Yeah. Yeah, they recently uh, released a movie. I think it was last year in theaters, which is basically a live it was a recording of one of their live concerts, and they just had a bunch of 3D stuff kind of chucked into it. Uh, I guess that's uh, they they did that too, and yeah, it's it, 3D is making a comeback. So. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, that's supposed to have you you heard about the James Cameron film that they're making there? Uh, I'm the not Aviator. sure. Not. It's supposedly it's all going to be 3D, and um, George Lucas is supposed to make all the Star Wars movies into 3D, I guess, and. Well, I know. I got a friend who's a director at Disney, and uh, he says now they can take pretty much any old movie and make it to 3D, but it's a very expensive process, so they're not doing it with everything. They're not going to do it, say, with the Bowery Boys picture. <laughs> right. <laughs> George has. They're not going to see Ishtar in 3D. <laughs> the trouble with 3D, though, is, in my case, my own personal, is after a while, I went to a 3D festival they had here, went over a period of several days, and by about the end of the second day, I I was really getting tired of it. Yeah. I was really wanted to see a flat movie again. <laughs> I mean, is the effect still like the green and red and the, no, the, the green goofy and red glasses? Kind of a myth. That most of the stuff was not green and red. Uh, it was. It was. It was. Um, oh, what's the process called? It was. Um, it was actually two separately projected images. It was a Polaroid process. So the green and red was mostly comic books and things like that. There's very little actual movies that were ever done in three. You know, in green and red. Oh. And most of those were done like in the 1940s or in the you know silent days. I did not know that. I actually have some Star Wars comics that were 3D, mm. made by like Blackthorn and some obscure uh, publisher. So, um, would you like to tell us a little bit, a bit about your uh, your films today? Well, I'm you know making real movies now. They're low budget. Um, low, bu- I call them low budget, campy, very sexy horror pictures. <laughs> It's six of them. We did Dinosaur Valley Girls. That was our first. That was done about 12 years ago. And that was kind of a, you know, I used to say you heard about dinosaur DNA. Well, this is dinosaur TNA. Then we did four what they call soft core movies, which are these things you see like on Cinemax at 11 o'clock at night, which had these long and, to me, very boring 
simulated lesbian love scenes. I finally got tired of doing those. And the last one we did, Blood Scarab, is not a softcore. It's just a, kind of an R-rated, if we submit it for rating, R-rated uh, old-fashioned horror movie with some naked girls in it. But it's, it's a vampire and mummy film. And it's a sequel to four other movie, the other four movies that we did. And it's the first time we ever had a theatrical release. We had a, a big premiere in Chicago um, a couple months ago. I brought the cast in and everything. We had newspaper coverage and radio and TV coverage. It was a big deal thing, and it's opened up a lot of doors for us because um, because we had that premiere. You know, getting a theatrical release is like getting a stamp of approval on, on your film. It kind of legitimizes it and elevates it a few levels. And uh, so now we're getting all kinds of offers that we never had before. I still have to raise the money uh, that I put, I, I put my, use my credit cards for to pay for the post-production costs in order to meet the deadline for the theatrical premiere in Chicago. So I'm, yeah, I can't even think seriously about making the next one until we get that paid off. So if any of your listeners out there know any people that want to invest in the movie that's already out and comes out on DVD in about a month, um, now is their chance. Just have them contact me and I'll give them all the details. Now, when you see, uh, um, when you say theatrically released, is that just like major cities or? Well, we've only done it in Chicago so far. Okay. And I was, uh, that's really all you need. All you need is in one theater and you can say it's theatrically released. Oh, okay. We're, we have, we'll have two theaters in Chicago on this one. Um, but, um, yeah, we could go anywhere with it. It's just a matter of finding the theaters. Mm-hmm that are equipped and, you know, uh, ready to run independent movies. Are there any plans in your future of any uh, possible uh, superhero-based characters in a film? I have nothing really in mind. i got a couple ideas for stories and things in the back of my head that I've been kicking around for years, but uh, more, they're all like comedy spoofs, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, as far as having full scripts and ready to go, they're all pretty much in the horror genre. Or I have another Dinosaur Valley Girls film I want to make, but... That's going to be, require re- raising a lot more money because of the special effects involved. That would be like a half a million dollar movie, where our other movies are about a hundred thousand. Have you seen our website, uh, the Frontline Films website? Yes, I have actually. Yeah, that, that's got a lot of photos and things of what we're doing now. Yeah, I, I checked that out. And uh, if you have anything, do you have any banners for other websites? Because I will gladly post one on my website to help you out. <laughs> Well, I've got the, I got the, my three websites. I've got DonaldFGlute.com, right. and there's the I was a teenage movie maker website, and then there's uh, FrontlineFilms.com. So those are the only ones that um, that I have. All right. Well, I'll, I'll gladly put those on my links, and I'll also get, you know you know mention you in the uh, actually at the head of my next update on my website, and uh, as well as Chris's website. I'll make sure I get those up on the uh, FFP. It's, it's been a fun fun conversation, and. Um, you know, I hope you get some, you know, some positive response. And, uh, you know, if you, want to, if you ever want to do it again sometime, you know, we can always do another one, too. Absolutely. If you ever have anything that um, you want to discuss, you want to plug, um, certainly contact us and let us know. Okay. So I've certainly enjoyed having you on, and it's a certainly a great pleasure. Cause well, it's been fun to be on. It's nice talking to you guys, too. And I'm glad you have an interest in my old work. And, Absolutely. Uh, and the new work. It's an honor. And, uh, Yes, it is. It's truly an honor to have you on, Don. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And we can thank call you. you Don. We're so happy. You're the, like the Don. <laughs> Just don't call me late for dinner. You're like the Don of fan film. James Brown of fan films. You like the, <laughs> the James Brown of fan films. <laughs> that's your, that's your I actually recorded a song you. in the voice of James Brown once called Feeling Good in the Badlands. <laughs> Trying to negotiate with a company in New York about putting them out on CD. They were just out on cassette before. Pete Von Charlie, who was a comic book artist and storyboard artist, and I recorded three albums of paleontology-related rock and roll songs. Okay. And one of, them, one of them we did in the style of James Brown. It was called Feeling Good in the Badlands. So, anyway, i got to go. Okay, sir. So, uh, great talking to you guys, and uh, good luck with your show, and uh, and I hope uh, somebody listens to this. <laughs> There's a couple people out there, I think. Thank Thanks, you. Don. Thank you, sir. 
Okay, you take care. Take care. Yeah.